Um, thank you for coming. As Lori was saying, there's a few of you who have been here for I think almost every session. We should have had some some like punch cards for you to win some <laughs> tickets next year or something. Um, but we only have, including this session, three more to go this semester. So we're really excited to have uh, Chris Gaffney here with us from New York. Uh, he was just in Brazil last week. He's headed to Washington, D.C. next week where he's at a conference of 6,000 people. So our, uh, our teacher-student ratio is much better at this event but today. Um, our next two events to wrap up the semester, next Tuesday, uh, we have Chris McCleary, who's the general counsel for the United States Olympic Committee. He's coming from Colorado Springs to be here. And I know Chris would love to be here for that discussion. And then uh, April 11th, to wrap it up, we won't be in this building. We'll be at the Islamic Center of Nashville on uh, 12th and South. Uh, uh, with Rashid, who's a huge uh, Vanderbilt fan and a uh, big student of um, Muslim athletes. And that, that'll be terrific to wrap up the series. Um, but today, uh, we have Ben Legg, who's going to be our, our interviewer. He's a senior lecturer of Portuguese here at Vanderbilt. Um, and among other things, he teaches a core, his research interests are U.S.-Brazil cultural relations, travel narrative, gender, sexuality, and national identity. And um, comes highly recommended by Professor Marshall Aiken, who was one of my professors when I was uh, a student here many moons ago. <laughs> and Marshall is friends with Chris and his wife. Uh, so there's sort of a, a small world of Brazilianists that uh, all know and respect each other. Um, but getting to know Chris a little bit this morning, I think this is going to be a fascinating discussion and sort of challenge um, maybe some, a lot of our beliefs about the value of the Olympics, whether they should even exist, period and the impact that um, investing in hosting an Olympics has on a city and what's destroyed uh, in that process and even in the aftermath of hosting the Olympics. And Chris is not only an expert on Brazil, but on uh, stadiums, and stadium culture and how that influences cities and decisions that are made um, in these mega events and mega stadiums uh, going back uh, through time to present day. Uh, he's a real expert in this field and we're really, really lucky to have him here on campus today, and he'll be speaking to some students on campus after this talk. So thank you to both of you for okay. being here. Um, as usual, have a little discussion, then we'll open it up uh, to the audience for questions. So please be thinking about your questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Chris, for being here. Um, and thank you all for showing up. This is going to be, like uh, Andrew said, a really interesting conversation, I believe. And um, we're going to try to talk for, you know, maybe I'll give them three or four questions, and then we can spin things out into the audience. Um, and I'd like to take this conversation from Rio, which is where we're going to begin, to Nashville, where we have had a lot of conversations lately about stadiums. So I think that this will be something um, that'll, that'll engage this crowd, I hope. So let's start. Uh, first of all, uh, Chris, if you could maybe talk a little bit about what um, has triggered your interest in the stadium as a place and in soccer as a sport, um, just as a way of introduction, and then we'll dive into the Olympics a little more specifically. Sure. Well, thank you, first of all, for the invitation, and thank you for coming out. Pleasure to be at Vanderbilt uh, again. Um, I grew up playing soccer in the suburbs of Dallas, was the captain of my university team, and then when I started traveling the world um, without speaking anything other than English, I found out that my boots my football boots were the best interpreter that I had. And so everywhere I would go, I would immediately have a group of people to play with and then someone to go drink beer with, and I'd inevitably end up on someone's couch for a week. And I would learn, you know, all the key words about uh, you know, swearing or, or at least ordering beer, <laughs> ordering beer in a foreign country. Um, and so that experience of being able to connect with people across the globe through sport was really formative for me. And then as I continued to travel and continued to explore the world, um, I discovered that it wasn't just football, but baseball. And so I went to a, a baseball game in Nicaragua. And I said, what? Well, I was just in Costa Rica, and everybody played soccer. And now I'm in Nicaragua, and no one plays soccer. Why is that? And I said, well, oh, colonial patterns of occupation by the US Marines might have dictated something that was going on in Nicaragua. Um, and so then I started realizing that culture and sporting histories were deeply tied with geopolitical considerations, um, world historical trajectories, etc. And that what all these places had in common wasn't, uh, was, was a stadium, 
right? And so then thinking about the stadium is kind of the, one of the world's most diffused uh, architectural forms, whether it's rugby stadiums in Fiji, um, soccer stadiums in Palestine, cricket stadiums in Delhi, all these places have stadiums in common. So I thought it was a really good lens through which one could start to understand the world in a more productive um, and complicated way other than just going out and playing the sport, which was always a lot of fun itself. Okay. Great. So let's um, go from stadiums to some recently renovated and in some opinions destroyed stadiums. Um, and let's talk about the Olympics and World Cup that were held in Rio in the past, uh, within the past, at this point, seven years, since 2014 on, um, no, five years. And uh, one thing I would like to bring up is, why do you think that a city aims to host an Olympics? Like, what are the motivations that you think that a city, and in the case of the Olympics and, and in the World Cup, a country would have to try to um, use athletics in this way and you know grand scale spectacle athletics as a way of kind of raising its own profile in the world before answering that question i think we need to back up a little bit and talk about the idea of the city pursuing it um, their cities do not have uh, wills of their own they don't a city doesn't desire something there are certain political and economic agents within a city that pursue these events for very particular ends so it's not correct to simply say that Rio desired the Olympics there are a very limited group of people that articulated a World Cup and Olympic project that had their very closely vested interests close at heart in the realization and this is also true in Nashville and we'll talk about that a little bit later but the main goal, in my opinion, is for the exercise of power. The Olympics are a, a way for people to accumulate wealth, prestige, power, cultural capital, uh, symbolic capital, uh, social capital, and to use that for the furtherance of their own agendas. Uh, whether that agenda is for the benefit of a city or not depends on the, the tone and character of the governance of the city. Uh, and this is true in every city. And so if the Olympics are hosted in Dallas, the Chamber of Commerce, the mayor, the sports industrial complex, Jerry Jones, etc., are going to be very much behind that Olympic project, not only politically, using their political clout, but using the media and their financial interest to ensure that whatever that project, however that project unfolds, it will benefit them and their interests. So, in the case of Rio, this uh, pursuit started actually in the mid-90s. Uh, and Rio was a serial bidder for the Olympics and failed in the pursuit of the 2002 and 2006 and 2012 Olympics. And so in order to uh, show that they were ready for the big time, they uh, got the Pan American Games in 2003. And so as kind of a test run for the Olympics, uh, they hosted the Pan American Games in 2007, on the eve of which many dozens of people were slaughtered in one of Rio's favelas as the military went in and tried to secure, quote unquote, the city for the realization of the games. They built stadiums, they removed people from their homes, they did, they refurbished uh, other stadiums, built transportation lines, and basically had a military occupation of the city for three weeks, which got the thumbs up from the IOC. And then that international articulation that comes out of those relationships then allowed them to go on to bigger and more impactful projects with much more money involved. And, and by those, those games were, uh, more than 10 times over budget. So Pan Americans, which shows that you can project a budget, go 10 times over, and that can be considered a success. Um, so to kind of spin off of this, you, you brought up especially kind of um, symbolic weight to these events. And you know, before we move on to talking about the kind of real results and you know, things in Rio itself, what kind of symbolic gain does the city make from hosting an Olympics? Can you think of, you know, any examples, and, and in, you know, not even just a city, but kind of a country or, or a region? Um, what is this gain um, in terms of the symbolism? Because I think that's something we don't necessarily think about a lot after the Olympics or even mm. during that, you know? Well, I think if we think back to 1936 and the symbolic nature of the Olympics for uh, Nazi Germany, we can 
spin that forward pretty well, pretty fast into the present. And those, those symbolic, the symbolic nature of the Olympics has not changed th since that time. And so this is a, a way of legitimizing political regimes mm -hmm. as well as carrying out internal political choices that have impact on people's lives. Um, so, uh, so if we jump forward to the modern era, looking at the 1988 Olympics in, in Seoul, this was a way for the then military dictatorship in South Korea to launch Korean industrial products on an international stage, as well as using their military authority to crush student protests in the country and to develop new areas of Seoul for real estate interests. And so the legitimacy of the Olympics, that it, give, it gives a certain legitimacy on the international stage that allows for domestic politics to play out and geopolitical considerations to be realized. If we then go even further forward to 2014 and the Sochi Olympics, uh, this is a real coup for Vladimir Putin's government. And within two weeks after the closing of the Olympics, he took, they took Crimea because that Olympics gave them the geopolitical legitimacy to do that with no repercussions whatsoever. Uh, and you know, we see Trump pursuing the 2026 World Cup. We see uh, the Qataris with the, with the 2022 World Cup. The, uh, the Olympics and the World Cup have this symbolic international legitimacy that uh, governments, and particularly uh, strong men or women, mm -hmm. can use to legitimize their regimes. Very interesting. So um, let's talk about Rio. And um, in, you know, I'm kind of rolling the World Cup and the Olympics in together, but they were within two years of each other. And a lot of the kind of big scale, both facilities development projects and then also like urban redevelopment was kind of designed with both in mind. Um, but what are some of the, the projects that happened in Rio, you know, in the build up to the World Cup and then to the Olympics? And what, who were some of the losers from these projects that you can think of? Well, the losers are numerous. Uh, in, the, in the years leading up to, I lived in Rio for six years uh, from 2009 to 2015. So as these projects were rolling forward, more than 77,000 people were evicted from their homes in Rio in preparation for the Olympics. Not as much as Beijing 2008, which was 1.5 million that were removed from their homes. Um, not, and London also had this. Uh, Tokyo is undergoing this. So there's all, you know, anytime you have big infrastructure projects coming into a densely packed city, you're going to have forced removals of people from their homes. Yet all of the projects developed for these games are designed by a very small group of vested interests. And so in Rio, one of the ideas was to expand development to the west of the city. And so that's where the Olympic Park was put. And so transportation lines were put there to facilitate cars, um, you know, the, you know, uh, people's individual mobility to this part of town, which then was associated with real estate pe speculation and the transformation of zoning laws to allow different kinds of construction so that the real estate companies could really make a killing and the construction companies that were building the roads, et cetera. Um, and so there are winners and losers in every case, in every city, but in Rio, which is already a, a tremendously unequal city, those who were on the losing side lost more than, because there aren't as many protections for them under the law. Um, in general, this is the way things happen because the project that is handed to the IOC, d designed behind closed doors with no public input, is necessarily transformed into law through the Olympic city hosting contract. And so this is a real problem for democratic representation in places like Brazil um, and, and Los Angeles in 2024 and any democratic country that hosts the World Cup or Olympics, there is an inevitable democratic deficit in city governments and representation. And so everybody loses. What, um, what were some of the responses to this? And um, you know, these are things that I think that's all to know. What, how, did, how did people in Rio and in Brazil in general respond to a lot of this? And, and how did that have an impact on kind of broader events beyond the actual hosting of, of you know, that mess? 
Well, I don't know. It's been a while now, but um, I don't know if any of you remember about five and a half years ago, there were really big protests in Brazil on the eve of the Confederations Cup, which is FIFA's test event for the World Cup. Uh, millions of people in the street, tear gas, threatening to you know, close the streets and uh, to the stadiums, and, and these protests were really violently repressed. And the general consensus was that people wanted FIFA quality ho uh, hospitals and schools not FIFA quality stadiums. And so the government was spending as much as 20 billion US dollars to provide stages for FIFA to make the highest profit that's ever made, while at the same time they had to stand in line for three hours to get into a hospital. And so the, the diversion of public money to private profit for a Swiss-based company was seen as an affront to good governance and transparency in Brazil. And so people went out on the streets to protest that. Uh, during the World Cup, it wasn't as uh, prominent because, frankly, people learned their lesson in 2013 that if you go out on the street to protest the World Cup, you're going to get hit hard, uh, and it's dangerous. And there were, in Rio alone, there were 85,000 police, extra police forces for the Olympics. And so there's very little in the way of protest. And when you bring up these, these staggering numbers, $20 million on stadiums and this not going to education and health care, um, has there been any kind of explicit connection made um, in the kind of corruption scandals that have been rocking Brazil for this also five year period and, um, and this kind of spending on the event? The, well, absolutely. Uh, the governor of Rio is currently serving, I think, a 35-year term for corruption, and one of the main elements of that corruption charge was the development of the Metro for the Olympics, which was a project that his wife was the lead lawyer for, for the firm that got the contract. And so it was a nine billion US Metro, which was only about six stops, and about, it's one of the most expensive per kilometer metro lines in the world, and, all, and half of that money was gone to corruption. And each one of the major construction firms in Brazil that were associated deeply with these World Cup projects, every one of them was indicted in some way in the un unfolding Lava Jato uh, corruption dealings. And the lead guy, the, the guy that was the owner of the biggest construction company in Brazil that constructed four out of the 12 stadiums for the World Cup that was involved in de designing roads and infrastructure in many of the World Cup cities, and in Rio in particular, is also behind bars for corruption. And so these, when I say that hosting these events and building infrastructure on the deadline of the Olympics or the World Cup facilitates corruption, it makes it, it not, doesn't just facilitate it, but it exacerbates the pre-existing conditions. Brazil operated on a known system of corruption and collusion. When you have then, say you have to develop all these projects in this short time frame and we're going to fast track contracting and eliminate environmental studies and have closed door bidding, how is that possibly going to improve an already corrupt situation? It doesn't, it makes it worse. And so this is also true in London, it's also true in Japan, it's also true in, in Los Angeles and, we, and, and Korea. The president of Korea had to resign her position for corruption scandals associated with construction for the Korean Olympics last year. The, the head of the J Japanese Olympic Committee just stepped down because of a vote buying scandal to get Tokyo 2020. So this is not just national and local politics, it's, it's also international. It's a, it's a global system of corruption that has at its core the facilitating agencies of the IOC and FIFA. Um, well, with this in mind, um, what, if any, positive impacts did the hosting of the World Cup and the Olympics have on Rio? And maybe we can go beyond Rio now and start to kind of broaden this conversation. And can you think of any places where you, know, you believe that there was positive impact from hosting this kind of thing, from establishing you know, stadiums, new stadiums, and then uh, actually I'll hold on back to that, but like once you get to stadiums, the money is going to be for you. So there's, yeah. The World Cup is one of the world's greatest parties. 
if you can afford to get it, get there and be there. So and this is basically a, a wealthy, it's a party for wealthy people from around the world to get together. Um, people save, many people save a lot of money over their whole lives to go to the World Cup every four years. Um, and so in that sense, it's a, a nice coming together of football fans. But it tends to be typically male, typically young guys, typically drunk, typically doing stupid things in a foreign place where they can get away with it for a month. So all that said, it's still a fun party. Well, the Olympics, the Olympics is different because it tends to, there are different kinds of tourists. Uh, they tend to spend more, uh, they tend to come to see specific events. But again, it's, these events are designed for, elite sport is for elite people. And not just the athletes, but for the audience as well. Incredibly expensive tickets. For instance, to get a ticket to the World Cup in Brazil, you had to have a credit card. The vast majority of Brazilians do not have credit cards. And if they do, the average percentage rate, the APR is 180%. 180% APR in Brazil. It's scandalous. Brazilian banks are the most wealthy in the world for a reason, because they have these insane things. And so, you, so it wasn't for the Brazilian people. On the other hand, you did have tens of thousands of Argentines, these young kids, all piling into their crappy 1980s cars and driving from Argentina to Rio and camping on the beach and partying and having a good time and teaching the Brazilians, who are fairly isolated from the rest of Latin America, about how fandom works in other places. And so that was interesting for the Brazilians to see how other people in Latin, American, in Latin America sing for their team, follow their team, are actually more passionate than Brazilians about football. Um, other than that, it's a, it's, a, it's a really expensive party. And they're really hungover, still. <laughs> Even the kinds of, you know, we had brought this up a little bit, but if you can kind of give these examples. Even these purported benefits in terms of transportation networks, actual athletic, um, you know, facilities left behind. Um, you know, can you think of, and once again, we can go beyond Rio, like with the case of Rio, do you think any of that left a positive change? And then outside of Rio, can you think of a case where maybe it has, you know, left a positive change? Um, yeah. well, there's a lot of new evidence to suggest that the transportation lines built for Rio have actually reduced accessibility for those who most need it in the city to key points of the city in, in order to access to labor markets, access to health care, access to recreation. Because those new transportation lines eliminated all the other transportation lines. And so you're basically channeling people through certain, through, you're eliminating choice and funneling people into certain nodal points. However, for the upper middle class that lives in this very wealthy suburb, the southern suburb, they built a metro line that goes straight to the center, this corrupt metro line. That works really well for the people who least need it, um, including my family that lives there. And so when I'm there, I can catch a, a bus to the metro and be downtown, and what used to take an hour and a half now takes 40 minutes. So that's great, but I, have, I can also get an Uber, I can also ride a bike, I could fly a helicopter, whatever. I, I've got a million. Yeah, not, it's, it's a very minuscule part of the population. But and then left behind is the good name for most Olympic infrastructure. Even in London, the uh, National Aquatic Center is used on a daily basis, but it is the most expensive aquatic center in the world to maintain because of the iconic architecture. Uh, Zaha Hadid designed it. And typically, uh, swimming centers have a very low ceiling because of the heat that escapes from the pool. You have to heat the pool, but if it's a big building, the heat escapes. This is an arching, wonderful, and so it costs a ton of money to maintain it. And the Olympic Stadium in London was also the source of inevitable scandals and overpriced schemes, and they took for, for six years to get a tenant in there to reform an Olympics track for, for, uh, for football. And so even in, well, can't say much about the British democracy at the moment, but in a generally robust democratic city that has checks and balances, that had uh, some modicum of transparency, it didn't work. And that's the best case scenario you can talk about. Mm -hmm. So let's, um, to wrap up our conversation and start to get there, um, this is not the most nice culture I have, but that's right. thought through now. So, you know, when we think about you know, going into your own specialty on stadiums and on the facilities as places. 
Um, and we think about the, the legacy left behind by Olympics and World Cups and mega elite athletic events. What is the best that a stadium can be for its city, for its place? And do you think that the way we are doing stadiums now as a, a global sporting world that's very concerned on a certain level of elite professionalism um, is living up to what you think the best a stadium can be? A stadium as a place of gathering and of collective emotion, collective meaning, uh, can run the gamut of things. So even the national stadium in Chile where Pinochet kept political prisoners and tortured them can still be a place of joy on the weekend even though they have memorials for the people that were killed in that stadium. And so public sta I, I think that public stadiums for the public good are okay. I don't have a problem with the public spending money on stadiums as long as they're used for the public. What I think is completely distorted both in the, the model of FIFA, the IOC, elite sport, and especially in the United States, is the ways in which that cities are held hostage by companies that are given antitrust monopoly exemptions. So the NFL, MLS, Major League Baseball, hockey, basketball, all have antitrust exemptions in the Congress that allow them to operate as monopolies. And so they can pick up and leave and go wherever they want. And so cities are held hostage because if they don't pay the money for a team, they'll just find someone that goes to the highest bidder. It's like the Amazon bidding, right? So it's basically the Amazon model of sports. That said, even if you do want to spend public money on a stadium, you should have more than just a football game there eight days a year. The ridiculous stadium downtown Nashville, eight days a year it's used, or 12 days a year. What is it doing the rest of the time other than taking public money and taking up potentially useful space? Why don't we have elementary schools in stadiums? Why don't we have health centers? Why don't we have senior care centers? Why don't we have physical rehabilitation to deal with all the brain trauma that those football players are eventually going to suffer. Why don't we have, use them as community center, uh, put in a driver's license center, use, gov use this government office. The public paid for it, it should be of public use. And as we do it now, it's a subsidy for billionaires. And I think that that model is clearly broken and one that is easily manipulated with the emotive, emotive content of sports in the United States and a complicit media that doesn't want to look at the business model that sustains the, public, the publication of, frankly, vapid coverage of sports in the United States. All right, well, let's uh, open this up. There's a lot to, to chew on here. Um, if nobody, you know, well, we already have some of these, so let's go. I was going to say Andrew can start, but let's uh, um, go back right there. I got a question about um, for the governance and the ability to X city or X country says, I want to host it, and the ability for our citizens to push back. Let's assume it's a democratic, Western, westernized country. Um, and you mentioned Amazon. So I'm correlating Amazon and their recent, they said they're going to go to New York, and people in New York said, no way. Now, granted, it's on a different scale, but I want you to comment on how, because there's obviously politics tied with that. Yeah and want to see how successful the local politicians were there saying, you know what, we don't want your 10,000 jobs and the crap you're going to bring with us. But I'm seeing if there's any correlation, anything Absolutely. that's growing in democratic society where they can actually say, you know what, we don't want it. Absolutely. We've seen a huge increase in this in recent years of citizens groups pushing back against Olympic bids in Hamburg, in Rome, in Oslo, in Boston. Boston in Denver, um, in Calgary, uh, in Switzerland even. They've had, refer when, whenever cities, whenever or city uh, organizations, citizens organizations can push a referendum on the table, it's inevitably defeated. I mean, the, the Olympics are defeated, despite having w far more resources to spend. Because the, the groups that are pushing for them are Chamber of Commerce, they have the media, they have the politicians, they have all the business. So that movement is growing because people see it's, that the IOC is a really bad business partner. And what 
the same as people in New York. So they didn't have, no one had a say in the articulation of that Amazon contract with the city and state. There was no democratic input to that despite the elected officials, or basically two elected officials being behind it. So once they see that that's on the table, they can, then you can say, okay, no, none of that. And to my knowledge, there's never been a grassroots movement to bring the Olympics to a city. Citizens don't get together and say, oh yeah, we need an NFL team, bring that over here now, or the Olympics, we want that. And so it's always pushing back against something, and that movement has gone global. And I'm happy to say I've been a, a fairly key part of bringing that message around the world to say, okay, this is how we articulate against this extractive uh, machine. So there's an exemption in, in the Congress, in the laws of Congress, that allows Major League Baseball, the NFL, Major League Soccer, uh, and hockey to operate as monopolies. Operate as monopolies. So you can't, if you wanted to challenge the NFL, and this came out of the 80s, so there was this, this time in the 80s where the USFL was trying to battle the NFL, which is why Trump is so annoyed with the NFL, because he had a USFL team. And that league failed uh, because of the ability of the NFL to extract concessions from the government to give them antitrust exemptions. And that's, that is the core, that is the, if you took that away, you could have other leagues come up, you could have competing ideas about what American football is meant to be at the, at the quote unquote highest level, but uh, even the MLS, operates in a very collusive way against the lower leagues. And so MLS is a business model that, and Don Garber, who's the, the, sorry, Don Garber is the president of MLS who worked for the NFL for 20 years before going over to soccer. And so he knows very well how to extract concessions from cities and every single stadium project in MLS, the new stadiums, are always wrapped around some other real estate deal or a shopping mall or parking. And so there's, you look at the stadium but uh, what the, we call the stadium in Portuguese is a boi de caranha, which is a, if you have a herd of cows and you're going across a piranha infested river, you send the weakest one out front to get eaten by the piranhas and then all the other ones go behind it. And so the stadium is like that weak cow. It, it looks, you know, everyone's distracted by the stadium, but actually what's going around it is much more important. The Olympics has to, is something that has to, we have to be continually um, sold on. It's an ideology. It's, it's the Olympic movement, right? So what is the movement? It's this, it's a series of signs and symbols that we believe have some kind of value. Despite the fact that we know doping has gone unchallenged and unpunished. Despite the issues with sexual abuse in the US Olympic Committee despite the absolute lack of transparency, the lack of governance reforms, the cloistered nature of the IOC in Switzerland. The IOC has 93 members and is a multi-billion dollar institution, um, and, but yet they always manage to bring us back in by saying these are human values. We work with the United Nations. This is great good for humanity to come together through sport. And at every step we have to buy into that again because the only way that they survive is through the manufacturing of that consensus of their value. And that is a really powerful thing for them, and every time that gets eroded by a scandal, they have less and less power. Which is, uh, to the gentleman's point up there, we have fewer cities that are believing in that. Right? That's not enough to convince a city to fork over $40 billion to host the Olympics. Therefore, the crisis of the IOC is in finding cities that are willing to host, which is why they gave, there were only two cities for the 2022 Winter Olympics that bid. Almaty, 
points to anyone who can guess what country that's in. And Beijing. Which one are you going to go to? Kazakhstan or China? Which has the bigger market? I'm going to China. Does Beijing have snow? No. Where do they have to build it? Four and a half hours to the north, building a high-speed rail to op open up a whole new tourist industry so middle-class Chinese tourists can get up to the mountains and ski. There's no water in that region either. So they're diverting rivers to make fake snow on seven different mountains and illuminating thousands-year-old forests and removing people from their homes. This is the, but we're going to watch it because there are people waving flags and playing the national anthem and Bob Costas is going to tell us how cool people are. It's a bunch of bullshit in the literal sense of the term. It is a manufactured invention that we continue to swallow every two years. And unless we stop swallowing it collectively, it's going to continue along its way. Yeah, we talked about, uh, I kind of had two questions. My first one is based on, we started to learn our lessons. Who gets the money? Because that's the problem, because like, you know, I do you know, you never see it like an investing decision. So who gets, the, who, who gets the money? And my second question is based on, just a couple of weeks ago, we had a guy from uh, Atlanta, who sent us out of Atlanta, and listen to what you were saying, and listen to what he said last week. It seems like Atlanta Olympics was kind of right on the cusp of all this corruption, but it kind of missed out on this corruption. So I guess looking at what happened in Rio, can you say, I guess the same thing, you know, what was the biggest difference between Atlanta and Rio? All right, uh, the first question NBC. I think they gave uh, 12 billion to broadcast the Olympics through 2032, NBC. And CBC, Canada, BBC, Australian television, Japanese television, CCTV, China. To get those television rights, it's a multi, uh, it's billions. And that goes to 93 people, 93 people in the IOC, Not a, a non-profit organization in Switzerland. So. Starting from there, so NBC is the culprit on that one. And without the Americans, the Olympics don't happen, to be clear. Atlanta was greatly considered a failure by the IOC, but it could be considered a success in terms of the amount of public money spent, because it was a hugely privatized Olympics. And so the IOC doesn't like commercialism, but this was the Coca-Cola Olympics, right? And so they had, you know, they did remove two whole traditional uh, African-American neighborhoods from around the stadium center. They've just destroyed the Olympic Stadium last year. Um, so talk about how successful their urban planning. I mean, Atlanta is as a urban planning, not their, not their thing, right. <laughs> and so corruption is less because corruption is less in Atlanta. But inequality, access to decent transportation uh, did not improve with the Olympic Games. And it kind of furthered the commercialization of the Olympics, which frankly was already commercialized, but it was another leap forward in that way. I think for Atlanta as kind of the, the capital of the New South during a Clinton presidency, that had some symbolic import as well. Um, but other than that, you can't really say anything about the Atlanta Olympics, because when you go there now, you don't see any, there's no remnant of it. It's just a vague memory of a, a bombing and then some stadium stuff and just, what, it's kind of a non-event at this point. So I had some friends participate in Sochi, and I went through <coughs> Athens on my honeymoon, and I could see the Olympic swimming pool looked like just a left behind, empty weeds, just totally unusable. What you just said about the IOC and all their power, is it possible maybe for at least the Winter Olympics to go to this rotation of venues. I've read some talk about that because, like, if you watch NBCSN, like, the bobsleigh circuit, how many runs do we need in the world for that? But, I mean, Calgary's got one, I guess Vancouver, Salt Lake, Lake Placid, but is it even possible for that to happen that they rotate through four or five venues every 20 years? Because we think of what, what's the point of the Olympics? It's to make money for people. They're selling things. It's not about sport. 
It's not about reducing costs. It's about maximizing rents. Uh, and rents being Airbnb, Uber, uh, government contracts for, con for construction, building new bobsled runs, having, and then you know, building new uh, tourist sites for, for winter sports. And so the idea with the IOC is that sports need to be developed infinitely. And so we always need more bobsled runs. We always need more ski runs. We always need more of this, that. It's stronger, faster, higher. Not just for the human body, but for capital. And so my contention is that, and this maybe to answer your point about Rio, is that this is a, a hugely efficient rent extraction mechanism. It's highly mobile and it has no governance. And so it can go from place to place around the world and suck up money and then go to the next one. And all that money goes, not all of it, but a lot of it goes back to Switzerland, a lot of it goes into national and local elites, but none of it goes into the pockets of the people who are working as concessionaires or as janitors for these new stadiums. And so this business model found in Rio what they called a new world. And so this was the motto of the Rio Olympics in 2016, a new world, which coming from Europe is pretty classic, no? South America as the new world. Well, and that reflects on, you know, so if you think of it in that way, the Rio 2016 were Olympics or a form of neo-colonialism to go and extract money from newly wealthy Brazil. And, Rio, and the Brazilian government was happy to do it because they collected all this political capital on the global stage. Lula brought the Olympics and the World Cup to Brazil. That felt good to him because he was then accepted as kind of the Brazilian messiah in a way. But for the international business community associated with sport, this is a great opportunity to stick the straw into Brazil, suck it up, and go somewhere else. And the IOC has never returned to Rio. Not one member. And they still haven't published the final report from 2016 because they don't have good data. All that money's been siphoned off somewhere else. They can't even produce a final report about their own event three years later. So the point is to make money. The point of building the point of the NFL is to make money. You can do that best by getting better stadium concessions in a new stadium, in a new city. And if that means leaving 50 years of history behind, so be it. The logic is rent extraction from urban populations. And that's just the cruel reality of it. Yeah, that should be part of the requirements for bidding in the first place. Um, but for instance, Los Angeles just blew right by all that and now are trying to say, okay, well, we have this project that we're going to do. If you want to come on board and talk with us about it, you're welcome to. But that was never part, that's not part of the Olympic bidding process. It's required that they consult somebody in the city and determine what percentage of the population supports the bid but there's no teeth behind it whatsoever. And so, yes, there should be a referendum. It should be a long-term planning process. It has to be a 25-year window of planning to host the Olympics, because it's something you need to grow into and something you need to grow out of. But no politician thinks on a 25-year scale. It's just not the way they work. And so this is used by people like Garcetti, some <coughs> billionaire playboy who wants to, who has, has uh, national political aspirations, he's going to use the hosting of the Olympics in Los Angeles as a political trampoline. That's his idea. Uh, I came in a little late. Did you talk about the 84 Olympics in Los Angeles? Not yet. Would you like me to? I will tell the story when you get to it. What's your story? Civic Legal Foundation had a suit joined by the City of Los Angeles and SCEPA concerning the disposal of sewage sludge in the ocean. That suit got settled when Tom Bradley found out 
that he couldn't have any federal money for the 84 Olympics. My boss, at, one of my bosses at the time, Tom Bradley, <coughs> back to us, was on an airplane to argue with the EPA about the difference between the East Coast and the West Coast, the trenches in the ocean. <coughs> Tom Bradley landed, and he found out that the assistant director was on his way to argue the case with EPA, and he said, get that son of a bitch back here. Shocked. The case was that when Tom Bradley went to D.C., they told him they couldn't have any money. <coughs> he said, and they told him why, and he said, where do I sign? Yeah. Shocked. Now, uh, is the East Coast me. different than the West Coast in terms of deep trenches? Having worked there, yes. <laughs> yeah, the LA Olympics are frequently held up as a model. Or, I mean, they were the new, a new paradigm for the Olympics because they were the only city, they were the only candidate city for the Olympics. After Montreal 76, which, was, which took 30 years to pay off Montreal, um, the stadium still is it's just a random wasteland of, of things in Montreal from the Olympics. Moscow had the 80 Olympics, but no one wanted the Olympics anymore because uh, Moscow had been awarded the Olympics before Montreal. Denver had been awarded the 76 um, Winter Olympics and pulled out because they saw it was going on in Montreal and said, no, we're not doing this. And then it went to Innsbruck, which had had them not so many years before. But for the 84 Olympics, there were only two candidates, Tehran and Los Angeles. 1979 Tehran, <laughs> not so much. So Los Angeles had a monopoly condition over the IOC. The only time in history that that has happened. And so they were able to dictate terms to the IOC in order to realize the Olympics. That said, they didn't spend as much public money as would later be spent, but they sure as hell did militarize the city for the realization of the Olympics. And that, and LAPD being what it was and is, had disproportionately strongly negative effects on populations in South Central and Watts. And not surprisingly, not long after that, riots <coughs> come out, you know, the 87? Was it 87 or 88? Yeah. Uh, the, no, the riots in, in LA. And so, and we will see that again, with the, the persecution of the homeless, the militarization of the city, gentrification, uh, privatization of public space. That will continue to happen, and it is happening right now in LA at an accelerated rate in pre preparation even for the 2028 Olympics. And so there are groups already mobilizing against the Olympics and trying to push through some kind of democratic conversation about this. But it's also well to remember that LA was not bidding for the Olympics <coughs> until Boston pulled out. So Boston was selected by the USOC as the bid city for the United States. Public pressure uh, eliminated that bid. 10 days later, Los Angeles had a bid together. Who put together that bid in 10 days and said, okay, this is what we're doing, and that is becoming law under a billionaire playboy. So who's interested in being served by the Los Angeles Olympics? It's not, it's not the homeless, it's not recent immigrants, uh, it's not low-income African-American communities. It's not commuters. It's vested interest in security, tourism, sports, real estate, and government. Um, and there's a right guess. Okay, yeah. good work. Based on what you've been saying, all the corruption, is there a city that you'd say has been least harmed by the IOC and hosting? Like Vancouver, Salt Lake. Yeah, wealthy cities are harmless because they can afford to be profligate with their money. Can you talk a little bit about Vancouver because I know traveling to Canada, they there's a lot of discussion of who would get the bid and um, transportation around Vancouver is really tricky. Amount yeah, of well, Vancouver. I mean, Vancouver's changed radically since hosting the Olympics. I mean, even you know, 2008, you had the global financial crisis, and, and but Vancouver did very well because all the money 
from China was already going into, into Vancouver real estate. And so now it's kind of a, a glass city. You know, all these, these really luxury downtown condos that have pushed out student populations, working class populations, uh, and other people that can no longer afford to live in, in Vancouver. Not just as a result of the Olympics, but the Olympics were a driving force within that process. They also uh, put through the Sea to Coast Highway, which is an eight-lane highway going up to Whistler, which went over uh, protected indigenous lands. And so the indigenous concerns were completely wiped off the table, and environmental concerns were also squished in the rush to build infrastructure for the Olympics. Additionally, the real estate in Vancouver was valorized so much that they eliminated systematically uh, what are called SROs, single room occupancy hotels, which is where many uh, lower and working class populations could afford to live in Vancouver during the week while they worked and then went back to their homes in the countryside on the weekend. So that no longer exists basically in downtown Vancouver. The Canadian Mounties were very strong armed in, in, in squashing protests blocking off public spaces for private use. And so the same thing happened, except in, in a time where there was already a lot of agitation in Vancouver in terms of rezoning and allowing foreign capital to, f to flow in and restructure the real estate market. Throwing the Olympics on top of that with the huge securitization of that space uh, quashed dissent and really expelled uh, lower income populations from the center of Vancouver. Yeah, well, that's a good question. I mean, one of the questions I always ask people, is if, if we didn't have the Olympics, would you miss it? Or would you really miss it as a part of your life? If you didn't have the World Cup, would you miss it? I mean, this summer we're going to have the Copa America, we're going to have the Euro Copa, we're going to have the Women's World Cup. We're watching soccer 24 hours a day anyway. Do we need more and more and more and more sport? Do we need an MLS team in, in, in Nashville? Do we need more of this stuff? Because the best athletes are going to find their level to compete at, no matter where they are. But do we need this kind of business model that takes human bodies, isolates them from society, makes them do insane things for 15, 20 years of their life, and then gives them nothing to go to afterwards? Professional athletes are unhealthy people. Mentally, for sure. Emotionally, definitely. Because you're cloistered within the same sex group for 30 years of your life. You get out at 35, your knees don't work, your brain isn't functioning, and you don't know how to relate to people of the opposite sex. <laughs> well, how is that good? Or the same sex, or anybody. So this is a, it's a very bizarre way of making people do things. And so this, hot, this achievement sport, even at the university level, is implicated in the business model. The NCAA is as corrupt as the IOC and FIFA, if not more so. The USOC should be banished for what they did, how they handled the sex, sexual abuse scandal with gymnastics. They should be banished from the face of the earth. The IOC, the, we should never have the Olympics again under this current model. And the only way to do that is to stop it. Or there shouldn't be another, for me, there should not be another American football game until we figure out how to stop people from getting CTE. It's human sacrifice. And that's, that's something that we don't talk about. That's something that's not safe. Do we need it? Do we need more of this? Will we miss it? What does it do for us, other than give us a party on Copacabana? And to me, the answer is, it just destroys lives. And I, you know, I was an athlete. I would have loved to have played in the World Cup, but looking at it from a critical social justice perspective, looking at it from a geographic perspective, from a holistic world, world perspective, it's about consumption, and that consumption is we're consuming ourselves, right? We're consuming our own human bodies in this way, and human detritus be damned at the end of the day, because we turn off the TV, or there's a, you know, there's a, a bone crashing a, a collision on an NFL game, time for a commercial, come back, the field is clean. But what happened to that person? What happened to their family? What happened to their dreams? Don't care. Simpsons. 
you know, it's, it's all the same to us. And that, and that needs to be changed. Right, yeah, 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 beyond the, the obvious horrors of it. Um, yeah, it's a powerful cultural thing, and it, it's, um, it's only as powerful as we make it in, in many ways. So if we start turning away from it, it becomes less powerful. And there are other venues where those same people can be seen. The Olympics gives people a huge platform, and so we're, we're keen to, or we watch them on that stage, and we're inspired by their you know, bravery or their talent or... And that's great, but there, you can watch these people all the time anyway. Right? Why do we need the Olympics for that to resonate with us? And so, and I know that's kind of a, a rhetorical question that has no answer because the Olympics are that thing that makes it resonate, and that's the very nature of their thing. So that platform for athletes gives us a global conversation to have about certain things. But I don't think that conversation happens in a particularly honest way. And if girls are being inspired to go be gymnasts at Bella Caroli's place in Houston, I don't want my daughter going there. I don't want them being treated by Larry Nasser. So if they're inspired to go be a gymnast and then they get sexually assaulted, how great was that inspiration? And so the systems in which we're putting our children are corrupt and damaging. Until we can find a way of doing it differently, we should really think carefully about our leisure choices and how we view sport and its value to our culture. This will be our last question. You were going to talk a little bit about uh, our city. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah, MLS. Do you need it? And so this is, who asked for the MLS team? Who, which of you got together with your neighbors and friends and say, hey, let's get an MLS team. That would be really cool. I want to spend our tax dollars, because Nashville has all its problems solved. Right? I mean, it's a perfect city. The transportation is ideal. <laughs> Transparent governance, water provision is universal and clean, and you know, all the best schools in the world, I'm sure you have. This is why we have such a highly educated pro population in this room, because Nashville is a perfect city. Why? More bread and circus. And so there's no, if there's no democratic participation in that conversation, then that conversation needs to be over. No stadium. No MLS team. It's that simple. Does this decision improve democracy in our lives or not? If yes, OK, well, let's go, we can continue the conversation. If not, go to Austin or somewhere else, not here. And actually, actually, and that's not even a right answer because that shouldn't happen anywhere. We need to express salt. And one of the things that most irritated me uh, in Re living in Rio from the people in Chicago, when they were the anti-Olympics groups in Chicago were holding up signs like, give it to Rio. It's like, what? Thank you for your solidarity, but no. <laughs> we don't want this. No one should have it under these conditions. No one should have an MLS team under those conditions. Uh, and so if you're not able to talk to your representatives about how this conversation is moving forward, then there's a real democratic deficit in the city that, needs to, that can be resolved around that very question. Why are we subsidizing the playthings of billionaires and facilitating human traffic around the globe with, with football? I don't understand. All right. Well, on that note, um, I think... We are going to be wrapping up for today, but um, thank you very much again to Chris Gaffney for your, um, you know, really thought-provoking uh, comments on Olympics, on kind of the necessity of mega events, or mega sporting events in general. 
Um, and there's a book. Uh, and he has a book, Temples of the Earth and Our Gods. Uh, so it's, t it's called Temples of the Earthbound Gods. Uh, stadiums and the cultural landscapes of Rio and Buenos Aires. It's a way of thinking about stadiums as this, as I was mentioning, is a, what is a stadium? What does it mean? How does it uh, move through the city without moving through the city? Or how do people move to it? What does it mean, like the symbology, et cetera, and how does it play out in two of the biggest cities in, in Latin America? Do you, did you ever look at what happened in Los Angeles to get the Dodgers? Yep, the removal of many, many people from Chavez Ravine. Many, just two different, uh, yeah, absolutely. There's a book being written about that now. Right? Yep. Um, well, I wish so much that David Williams were still with us because I think this would have been precisely the event that you would have been most excited about um, bringing someone into a college athletics department to say the NCAA is the most <laughs> he, he would have loved it. He loved to stir that kind of conversation up. You know, and uh, I thought this was just amazing. I'm so happy that you oh, came thank to, you. to be here and we're lucky to have you on campus. So thank you. Thank you. And thanks to you.